Thank you. I hope you can all hear me. So, yeah, as just noted, it's quite of a mouthful of a title. And if there's one thing I would like you to get away from this talk, is then it's what, how we can utilize some of the more modern techniques for machine learning, which are so successful in image recognition and natural language processing, and apply them to finance, in particular in a kind of asset pricing context, which is, is a quite hard machine learning problem because the signal of noise, the signal to noise ratio is quite low in this setting. So this is academic work we have done with a postdoc, uh, Zi Hao Zhang, and I will, I will give a reference to the paper which is, which is publicly available uh, later in, in the talk. Now, um, I want to present this work in kind of three stages. First, I will talk a little bit about market microstructure and limit order book data, which is the type of high frequency data which we will be using. That's a very important type of data because first of all, we have a lot of data. We know machine learning and deep learning in particular is very data hungry and it also has a bit more structure in it. So we'll be actually be able to apply some techniques. Then I will actually speak what I mean by multi-horizon forecasting models, and I will end with some, uh, with a little summary, but also some applications. So besides that being purely academic work, I will also mention how some of this work can be used and is actually used in practice at the end. And I'm quite excited that when this work uh, came out last year, it got quite some press coverage. It was the most read article in Bloomberg on that day, and we got some coverage in Bloomberg TV as well. So quite excited to be speaking about that uh, today. Now, um, I thought about putting in a slide to motivate machine learning and deep learning, but obviously with this audience, there's not much of a need. Everyone is, is, is used to it, not just here, but even, I mean, anyone in, in, in a normal life. I, for example, check just the weather before coming here today, and obviously I use Siri and I use natural language processing. Everyone uses it, but it's obviously quite interesting to see how we can make it work in a finance context. And the first bit, I wanted to get to is the data, so microstructure data and limit order book data. So most of you are probably familiar with limit order books. That's kind of the internal state uh, which is kept at an exchange representing the outstanding orders to buy and to sell. And here's just a little animation of a uh, limit order book. You see down there the orders, the levels of orders to buy. Up there the levels of orders to sell. Uh, those are also called the bid and the ask respectively. And obviously the top levels there which are closest together, that's just the best bid and the best ask. And the intersection is just the mid price. That's the price you see on the screen if you look at the Bloomberg terminal. But what's quite interesting here is that there's a lot of more structure in there. We can see the kind of microscopic interactions of supply and demand. And we could think about a situation where even though the price hasn't changed yet, we could potentially see an increasing demand to buy building up in a limit order book before the price eventually is pushed up by the increased demand. And this is the type of patterns which we would like to use machine learning techniques for to pick them up and make predictions where the price is going. Now, in the specific models we are talking about, we have to somehow get those limit order books and encode them in a way that we can stick them into our model. That's quite similar as in the context of natural language processing where you first have to find some embedding to turn your words into vectors. In this case as well, what we do, we utilize the limit order books, but in, we don't just take one limit order book into account. We take a whole sequence of, in this case, 100 limit order books. And time here is always in tick time. So we kind of take 100 limit order books in the sequence of events which happen. That's quite a useful time to use tick time because it's naturally um, regularized to the market. You could think, for example, a, a, a more liquid instrument there's more happening, so time is running faster than for a uh, less liquid instrument. So also, for example, during lunchtime, not much is happening, or not as much as in the later parts of the day. So there's more ticks, so time is running faster. By utilizing tick time, we have a natural normalization, and that makes it easier to stick data from different instruments into the same model, because we know data is an issue. We have to be able to train one model using multiple instruments. We can't afford to build one model for each instrument. So data normalization is quite important. So 
what we do here, we take those limit order books and we effectively represent them by what is shown in this picture on the right hand side. So here I have put the, the sizes on the top. So I have um, ask sizes on the top, bid sizes on the bottom, and below they have prices. Each horizontal column here is one limit order book, one of the 100 limit order books with time running in the horizontal directions. Up there are sizes, down there are prices. Now, you might be wondering, what the colors are. So the colors is effectively the value. So the, the value of the price or the, the value of the size of the level normalized using a running Z score. So a lighter color means it's kind of slightly higher than the recent past and a darker color means it's slightly lower than the recent past. And what's quite interesting about this picture here, so I'm not sure whether there's a pointer, but what you can actually see here, if I look at the top bit there, this kind of upper quadrant, I see there's some lighter color at the bottom. That actually means that over there, there was an increased bit size, so an increased uh, demand to buy, and subsequently, down there's the price, the price was darker, and then it went lighter, so the, the, uh, lighter. So the price went higher, but it went higher after we saw this increase. So it's kind of a pattern which, which I can see with my eye, and you think, well, if I can see it, surely an algorithm ought to be able to pick those patterns up. And that's exactly what this talk is about. It's, and you could actually think about whether those are images. I could use some techniques from image recognition, and that's actually what we did in some earlier work some few years back, we actually developed a model called DeepLock, which utilizes techniques from image recognition. And this model had actually found its way into a couple of uh, prime algorithms at investment banks. But today, I don't want to talk about this work about image recognition, but about a model which is inspired by natural language processing. And to do so, I just first want to explain this concept of multi-horizon forecasting, which is kind of at the center of this talk. So, here we have this situation, so I have this input data, those 100 sequences of limit order books, and now I want to make predictions. I want to make the prediction where the price is going, but I, I can ask, well, what time into the future? 10 ticks, 20 ticks, 50 ticks, 100 ticks? I can do it at multiple horizons. And if you think about a supervised learning setup, I would have to train one model for each horizon. I would train one model, say, for forecast of 20 ticks I had, one model for 50 ticks, and one model for 100 ticks. Now, that's not very efficient training multiple models, not just from the computational standpoint that I need multiple models, but also conceptually. You, you just think about it. If I'm good at predicting moves in the short term, I should be able to then extrapolate and get better predictions in the long run. So my intuition is that if I'm good at prediction, making predictions in the short term, I it should help me to make better predictions in the long term. But if I have separate models, I can't really utilize those insights. So the basic thing, what we are after, is having one model which does the prediction for all those horizons in one go. But obviously the question is, how can we possibly do that beyond kind of standard supervised learning? And there's where we seek inspiration in machine translation. So kind of we're all guilty of uh, probably using uh, Google Translate a bit too often when we just want to show off our uh, superior language skills and things like French, which I don't speak at all. And, uh, but maybe some of us haven't really thought about how this algorithm actually works. And since we use the same principle in our kind of price predictions, I will just highlight the workings of this algorithm. So, how it works in practice is, so I have those words, those words are in, kind of encoded into some vectors, that's the first step, I don't want to talk about that, but then I will kind of have this, this architecture which reads in word by word, and then it builds up this memory, H1, of the words it has already seen, and from this it creates this context vector. Now the context vector you can think about is effectively the kind of abstract meaning of the sentence. It's a bit like a third language. That's what the, 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 the computer thinks is the meaning of, uh, of uh, this sentence in its own understanding. And now you take this context and you infer the translated sentence. But the important thing is that you don't do it all at once, but you do it word by word. First you try to predict the first word, then the next word where you utilize again the context as well as the memory of everything you have seen so far, and in particular the first word. And then you kind of construct the whole 
translation. So this is exactly how these translation algorithms work. And in terms of terminology, this lower bit is also sometimes called the encoder, and this upper bit is called the decoder. Now, what I kind of described to you is how the model works if you've already trained it, and it can make the translation. If you want to train it, you basically fix the input, the kind of English sentence, you fix the output, the French sentence, and you optimize it so that the model is forced to find a good context so that it can then infer the translated sentence. So this is all done in the training stage, and you really need a lot of data to do that. So to do something like Google Translate, you first have to build Google Books to have enough data to do that. So this is why we look at things like high-frequency data to have it all a chance to be able to use this in a finance context. Now, in our setting, we are effectively using the same architecture here, which, by the way, is called sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture, where we just read in, instead of the English sentence, we now read in the sequence of limit order book snapshots, and where before we had this French sentence, we now make our predictions of price move, which in this case we cast as a classification, but it can be classed as a regression problem as well. Now, besides sequence-to-sequence, we also look at attention here. The problem with the sequence to sequence is, if you go back a little bit, that by kind of feeding this information from one memory to the other to the context vector, you kind of, you start to forget a little bit what was in the distant past. And that's quite bad, especially if you have things like periodic structure. If maybe what was yesterday is not important, but what was a week ago is important, then this is likely to get lost if you kind of keep on feeding things into each other. This is why you have this attention mechanism here, where you see this additional edge, it's also called the attention weights, where now this, this kind of context vector, it's not just feed it in the information from the last memory state, but it can attend to any of the memory states in its background, and it can decide to attend more to something which was a week ago than yesterday, which could be, for example, imported if you were to model things like uh, tube traffic or something like that. But those are the kind of architectures uh, we are using in uh, this talk. And I just wanted to give a little anecdote of um, why we think this multi-horizon model is good. And so imagine I gave you this sentence here and I ask you, well, tell me what the last word is. You will have a hard time to guess what, uh, that it would be few. But if I tell you, well, look, this is the next word, this is the next word, you will probably be able to very quickly figure out this sentence, which, by the way, is a quote from Winston Churchill, which is also born and died in, in Oxford. But this is a kind of basic intuition here. If we are able to make predictions small steps ahead, we ought to be able to make much better predictions uh, many ticks into the future. Now, 100 ticks, that's not a lot of time. It's just 30 seconds to a minute. But in a world where high-frequency traders only try to predict the next tick ahead, it's quite a long, long time, and you're really getting an edge by doing so. Now, leaving this anecdote and moving to the results, so we, we trained our model on uh, FTSE 100 data, and we first used five stocks for trading. We have one year of data, six months for training, six months for cross-validation, uh, three months for cross-validation, three months for testing. That's over nearly, it's nearly 200 million observations. So we train this model uh, using this data, but then also we further tested on another 20 stocks which haven't at all been part of the data before. That's what is known as transfer learning. So those effects are quite universal. They're not restricted to just those stocks, but they work also quite well on other instruments. What you see here, are the kind of out-of-sample results. And, and where we have here horizon on the horizontal axis of this diagram, you have horizon like 20 ticks ahead, 50 ticks ahead, and 100 ticks. And then we have F1 score, which is a form of accuracy for imbalanced data set. So what's kind of natural is as we go further into the future, uh, kind of accuracy goes down. Yes, that's, that's uh, as expected. But what is interesting to see, we can compare the single horizon models. That's the green line. And remember, for the single horizon models, we have to train one model for every horizon. So each of these three dots is one model which is trained against the multi-horizon models. And what's interesting to see is, so we have the, the yellow and blue line is sequence to sequence at attention, respectively. So at the 20 tick prediction, you will see that 
all these models perform quite closely, and actually the multi-horizon models perform a little bit worse. That's because they are more complex, and they really don't have an edge. They haven't seen anything shorter than 20 ticks. But once I move further into the future, 50 ticks and 100 ticks, I can see now that the multi-horizon models start outperforming the single horizon models. And this is exactly as expected and in accordance with our intuition, which I tried to explain earlier also with this little anecdote of the sentence. So this, this was one interesting bit, so how we can improve those predictions and make longer term predictions more viable using this high frequency data. And as I mentioned, this is all published research. It appeared in RISC uh, at the end of last year. And there's also the archive if you would like to have a look at the uh, article. And the code is also open source if you are interested. Now, a second interesting bit of this work was that we also utilized some uh, kind of alternative uh, hardware uh, for this, which was quite interesting. So usually we train most of those models using GPUs, but here we utilized also uh, intelligent processing units which are produced by Graphco. And this is actually the first application of this hardware in a fin finance, uh, finance context. So we were quite excited to, to, to be able to uh, look at it because so the intuition why it should work well is this, that those attention mechanisms are actually quite uh, computationally intensive and that's why people looked at things like transformers to actually overcome this computational bottleneck but here we decided to actually kind of keep the attention but go for some alternative hardware instead and was quite excited to see that we can see some interesting um, improvement five to ten times speed up in training when compared to just kind of regular GPUs and that's quite exciting because we know that not just Graphco, but a number of companies are looking into bespoke hardware for machine learning. So kind of this was all in terms of um, scientific results. So just to summarize, up to now we kind of reviewed a little bit of market microstructure and limit order books and we've seen how we can build forecasting models for single horizon and multi-horizon models where we utilize sequence to sequence and attention mechanisms and we saw that as our intuition was telling us at multiple horizons um, those uh, at larger horizons, those multi-horizon models outperformed uh, the single horizon models. And also we saw how we can utilize some interesting new hardware and see how it provides us benefits at least at the training stage. Now, um, finally, as promised, I also wanted to comment a little bit about applications because many of you work in finance and obviously you might be asking, okay, this is some academic research. How can you actually utilize this in practice? And here we see some use case in an execution algorithm. So also you work for Man Group, which is a big hedge fund, and obviously something like this is of interest in execution. The problem with those prediction models is that because the horizons are quite short, 30 seconds to a minute, price only moves so fast. So you can be very good at making predictions, but it's not long enough to build a standalone strategy where you trade in and out of positions, crossing the spread and paying fees. But if you are a market maker, like many HFTs are, or if you are a big investment bank or fund who do, does execution, this can be quite useful. So what we see here is the price trajectory. I say the best ask and the best bid in red and blue respectively, and what most modern execution algorithms do is they try to trade as passively as possible. So on average, at least you save the spread by uh, trading passively. So here we see actually the execution algorithm doing its job. So all these horizontal blue lines, those are orders, they are placed. And if you see a little X at the end, the order is cancelled. So here we see we kind of place, cancel, place, cancel. We're kind of chasing the price and only up there we get some fills. Now obviously, if we were here at the bottom and we had a good prediction of what's going on 20, 50, 100 ticks ahead, we could anticipate and cross the spread early on rather than trying to chase the price passively. Now those are small savings, just a penny here and there, a basis point. But obviously, if you trade billions or trillions, that adds up to a lot of uh, money. And that is where those algorithms are really used in execution, basically. And, and this is what I wanted to leave you with, that this work is also relevant in practice. And that's really all from my end. So thank you very much.